OK, welcome, everyone. This is the latest and greatest in Visual Studio for C++ developers. I'm Sai. I work as our team C++ developer advocate. And I'm Marion. I'm the program manager lead for the C++ team at Microsoft. Cool. So a little bit before we get started, come say hi at our booth. It's in the exhibitor hall outside Aurora D. Come talk to us. Uh, give us your questions. Give us your comments. Anything. We're here until Friday. Uh, yes, outside of RD. Also, take our survey, you could win an Xbox. It will be presented uh, before Herb's keynote on Friday. A little wiggle. So please take our survey. It helps us learn what the C++ community are interested in, helps us make our tools better. So please help us there. OK, so this is the kind of mission of our team at Microsoft. We want to make the lives of all C++ developers better. That's not just people using our tools, but everyone. So one thing we do is we participate in the standards by you know, writing our own papers, giving feedback on other people's papers, trying to help the entire process. We invest in our compiler and libraries for MSVC. We try and simplify library acquisition for C and C++ with VC package. And we're working a lot on our IDE to try and make it the most productive environment for C++ developers. We're also working a lot on Visual Studio Code, which has a C++ extension which you can use. So we're going to be talking about the 2, 3, and 4 in this talk. If you'd like to hear about Visual Studio Code, then you can come to Tara's talk tomorrow. And that will tell you all about what we're doing there for C++ developers. OK, so this is our agenda for today. We're going to start off talking about the IDE, what we're doing to make the, that kind of developer inner loop where you spend most of your time as productive as possible, targeting multiple platforms from Visual Studio and integrating tooling from across the industry. We're going to talk about our compiler and what we're doing for conformance, uh, build throughput, code analysis, and runtime performance. And then we're going to talk about what's in the future, what's coming in C++. What are the community interested in? So starting off with the IDE, when I talk about the developer inner loop, what I'm talking about is you, know, you spend your time editing code, building, debugging, testing, committing, and you go round and round and round this loop. And we want to make that as frictionless as possible so you can spend all your time actually doing this stuff and the tools get out of the way. So some things we're doing there are letting you target any platform from Visual Studio. This is not just a tool for targeting Windows. This is a tool for targeting Linux, Android, um, Linux, uh, Windows, pretty much anything which you could want to target. We also want to make it easy to get started. So if you have a CMake project, we don't want you to have to like, convert this to a Visual Studio solution on the command line and load it in. No, we want you to be able to just load CMake and use it as a first class citizen. We also want to make it easy to get packages. So dependency management, package management is a kind of hot topic in C++. And we're working a lot on this through BC package, which we'll talk about later. We also just want to give the best editing experience we can. You know, the usual productivity features, which you're all used to from IntelliSense, refactoring, and um, our debugging experience. And then something we're looking in a lot in the moment is tools from the whole community, you know, Clang, LLVM, Clang Tidy, Clang Format, GCC, different testing frameworks. We want to embrace these tools, bring them in, so that if you want to use these, you'll get a great experience out of our tools. So we'll now move on to a demo. All right, so what I have here is an open source project uh, using CMake called SuperTux. Uh, it's a platformer game, um, and I already have it loaded inside Visual Studio. Um, before jumping in and showing you the uh, inner loop uh, improvements that we made for editing, building, debugging, um, for those of you that haven't seen the CMake native experience, I just want to take a quick tour of, of how the idea lays down. So um, to bring this, uh, this project in here, what I did is I went to the new start window and just did open a local folder and pointed to the folder where uh, my CMake project is. Uh, in, Immediately after I did that, Solution Explorer popped up and listed uh, the disk view. And in here, um, in the background, it started indexing and to, to discover different features of, of this code base. One of the features is that it has a CMake list. And 
when Visual Studio discovered that, it associated a CMake configuration to it that you can see here in the, in the dropdown. And so it's a default configuration that it's being used to configure CMake. Uh, you will see the output of that configuration process running in the output window. Um, and if everything goes well, this is going to complete. Uh, if there are certain configurations that uh, you still have to pass on to CMake to, to successfully configure, uh, you can go to uh, Manage Configurations over here, and you can customize the, the settings. Um, another area um, that I want to show is the debug targets. So as soon as the configuration completes successfully, um, all of the executable targets are listed here uh, at the top. And if I just select uh, Super Tux and click Run, uh, we'll get a, a quick sneak uh, peek at the, at the game. But sorry, that's all we're getting. Uh, we, can, we can play the game in the after party. We're going to spend more time looking at the, at the game source code, OK? Um, so uh, another place where you can learn about what this project does is Solution Explorer. And as I mentioned, this is the disk view. Um, and um, if you're familiar with the project, the disk view will, will, will seem familiar. Uh, but you can use also search. So since it's a platform, I assume there's platform stuff in it. Um, so this is one way to discover it. Um, another way is to switch to the CMake targets view. So what we had before was the disk view, was the raw files on disk. Uh, CMake targets view is a logical view of how the CMake project is structured. So we get a full list of all the CMake targets being part of the project. Uh, we, can, we can expand it. We can look at the references of how of the, basically the dependencies between the different targets in CMake. Uh, we can see the list of files that are being part of this project. And uh, specifically, again, this is a logical view. So not all the files on disk may be part of the specific targets that we're looking at. So this is one useful way of, of discovering your project. Um, now, I showed the, let me go back to the, uh, to the disk view. So I, show, I showed search here. But another way to, to search inside the code base that we have um, is by using the go to window. Um, in here, you can search not only for files, but also for types. Um, so if I search for platform, I get uh, different, uh, different um, symbols. Um, I can filter. So if I can do F platform, I can only look at files. If I do T platform, I only look at types. If I do M, it's only members. But you don't have to remember all of this. All of these buttons at the top do similar things. Um, and again, this is a, a quick way of, uh, of navigating around the code. So if I open this file, another way to navigate in the code is by doing uh, go to definition. So let's just right click, go to definition. I can keep going. Um, as, I, as I navigate through code, uh, I want to show you that Visual Studio actually behaves as a browser. Uh, as you're familiar with, with a web browser, it has a back and a forward with a history. And as you go back and forward, uh, it, it will maintain state. And you can learn more about how this code base looks like. Um, if I right click here, uh, I can do final references. And this is another UI that um, we're constantly improving to make it asynchronous. The, the results are going to come. Uh, the analysis is done in the background. There are multiple ways you can look at, at these results. You can uh, show different columns. You can choose the grouping. Um, you can also, if I can uh, hover over here, you can filter based on, on some specific files or a specific area that you're searching for. Um, now, as you navigate through the code base, you may want to uh, set different placeholders, different reminders about the code base. So for that, you can use the, the, the bookmarking system. Um, so if I go, let's say, keep navigating back, and set a bookmark here as well, um, then I can find all of them in the, in the bookmark UI. And I can easily navigate between them with um, with the shortcuts F2, I think. Let's see, F2. We'll navigate between them. All right, another uh, place where you can start to learn a code base is the to-dos. Um, you know, there's a, a, there might be a saying uh, that uh, someone's to-do is someone else's problem tomorrow. Um, so you can go to uh, the task list. And something that we improved in 2019 is that when we scout a, a project, um, we actually find all of the to-dos across the whole code base. And again, in this UI, um, you can do the same filtering that you've done earlier or the same grouping. So if I do grouping by 
That's bath. Let's see. Let me try that again. Yeah, there we go. Let's let's hide all the to dos in uh, in the SDK because that's a bit disturbing. Um, <laughs> and let's uh, focus on the. Um, to do in the project. And again, this is an opportunity if you're starting a new project or you're joining an open source project, this could be an opportunity to contribute by, by taking some of those uh, to do's. Um, another place uh, to discover how a code base looks like um, is in the test explorer. And um, what we have here is um, a CMake project that has CTest configured to run um, Google test tests. Uh, Visual Studio is able to discover all those tests and is able to run them. Um, and if everything goes well, obviously there's no work for us to do, but I do want to shift into doing a bit of uh, code editing. I want to show you some features, so obviously magically one test fails. Um, so if I were to drill deeper into it, I have, I have my details here. This is the, the test and I get the exact location where the test failed. Um, if I hover over it, uh, the semantic highlighting tells me that is the return value of this function. Uh, so I'll just go to definition. Uh, F12 is the shortcut, but I can also hold control uh, and click, and it will take me to the definition. And um, as I mentioned earlier, to-dos are someone else's problem, so we're going to try to address this to-do today. Um, but before we do, let's take a look at this file. So what is the health of this file? This is the first time I'm opening. And uh, as I look around, uh, you can see a new um, status bar here that tells me uh, some of the things that are happening in this file. So there's no errors that IntelliSense could identify, but there are 10 warnings. And if I click on it, I'll get the, uh, the error list to show them to me, but I can also navigate really quickly through them. And we'll, we'll come right back to them. Another thing, uh, we get the current line number and the current uh, position. And also this button that tells me that there's a mixed, what it means means, means that uh, there's a mix of, uh, of line endings. So I can really quickly just click here and I can fix it. If I pick the wrong one, just undo and fix this one. And yeah, this was, did I pick the wrong one? Which one is the right one? Okay, anyway. Um, so let's come back to the squiggles. Uh, so what are the squiggles? These are code analysis warnings that are being uh, discovered by running our code analysis engine in the background. And what we heard many, uh, many times from you is that turning on code analysis sometimes can be a little bit intimidating because at build time you would get code analysis warnings coming from all of the files in your project and you not always can deal with all of those files at the same time. But something that you can act on is the code analysis warnings that you see in the current file that you're editing. Um, so that happens automatically and code analysis runs in the background. It identifies some very interesting suggestions. So um, in this case, it says that this function could be no except. So let's just add no except over here. And the squiggle should immediately go away. Uh, what else do we have here? The global initializer calls a non const per function. Well, let's make it a const per function to make this squiggle go away. You can see how this could be fun if you do it multiple times. Oh, the squiggle got bigger. Oh, it's a different warning now. It tells me that the const variable hello can be computed at compile time. Well, that's a good idea. So let's just turn it into a const expert. And there we go. We played whack a mole with three warnings already. And if I hover now over it, I can also see the end result of the const expert being evaluated at compile time because IntelliSense knows how to do that. Uh, there's multiple uh, other warnings that uh, you get. And uh, for some of them, we actually have um, some fixits available. So if I hover over this, it tells me that red val is uninitialized. And you can see a light bulb. And if I select it, I can say initialize variable and the auto fix is done. Um, some other fix it um, would be here telling me that I should probably use null putter instead of zero or null. Um, so again, I can do control dot, which is the shortcut for invoking the light bulb. I don't need to reach for my mouse and enter and the fix is there. Um, in general, code analysis has some very interesting warnings. Uh, these are kind of obvious and you would probably spot them and you would make changes yourself. But in large functions, you can get surprised by some of the warnings that IntelliSense can find, uh, that code analysis can find. So um, here, for example, it tells me that uh, this variable is only assigned once, so we could mark it as a const. Now, this function is short, but imagine a you know, 20, 30 line function that might not be that amazing, uh, that easy to spot. 
And the other one that's interesting is uh, don't use that move on constant variables. Like, wait, is result const? Oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. So I'm actually lying to myself thinking that that's going to get moved. It's actually going to make a copy. So that's maybe time to, to fix it. So that's, that's code analysis, and uh, I'll, I'll switch back to the to-dos that we have over here, um, and let's see what we need to do. We need to uh, basically find the, what did the uh, to-do set? We need to find the position where the character is. So we got a vector, and we need to look into it uh, to find where tax sits, and I know how to do that. Um, I'll, I'll use to find if to find the position that it's uh, beyond the current position. Um, and immediately as I type it, let me close the parentheses, I get a squiggle that tells me that uh, std does not have a member find if, and that's obviously because I did not do the include. And probably I know it, but Visual Studio can also help me find it. So I'll just do control dot again, and I get a suggestion to add uh, the pound include. And really quickly, I'll, uh, I'll go over here. You can see that the include algorithm got added. So let's go back over here where some red in the scroll bar. Uh, because we're probably still not done with this. So if I remember, uh, if I show parameter help, there's more parameters to be put in. Something that I want to point out is that we added some color to parameter help and to quick info uh, in this release. So it actually follows the semantic colorization that you pick inside the editor. Uh, so it's much easier to read and to follow. Um, and now what I need to do is, is type uh, begin uh, platform begin and end. And something that I want to point out here now is uh, the availability of IntelliCode results. IntelliCode is um, a feature that supports IntelliSense, um, where we take a large, co a large uh, set of code bases uh, that are publicly available, train um, on them, and identify patterns that are most commonly used in C++ programs. And then based on that, we offer what are the most relevant suggestions in a member list, for example. In this case, I am most likely to use size and begin. Of course, I can also use something else. Um, don't let a, uh, you know, an ID tell you what to do. But um, now I want to show you something else. If I do dot, uh, the, the relevancy of the results actually changes. Now that I use begin, I'm more likely to use end as a, as a second suggestion. So this is, this is quite dynamic, and uh, it can give you some, uh, some help while you type it. Oh, and I need to actually select end from this list. OK, and uh, to save you from watching me type, I actually have the lambda over here. So I'll use uh, shift, alt, and uh, arrows to do multi-select, and I'll remove this. Um, and now we have a full uh, lambda that will actually find uh, the element I'm looking for. And as I keep going here, I can see that um, the, the result is being returned um, is outputted by this function, find longest platform. So I'll just hit again, go to definition on this one. It's down here. Uh, and the good news with this function is that it's a template. This means that whoever wrote it uh, implemented a generic algorithm. Uh, it's very nice, probably used uh, in, in multiple places across the code base. The bad news is it's a template. So to understand it, I actually need to debug this code because IntelliSense is not going to help me much with this information. Um, if I hover over begin, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a iter, and if I, if I keep doing that, I'm not going to get a much help. But with, uh, with Visual Studio, you can actually get help for, uh, for the template IntelliSense. Um, so if I go here, you can see a bar because I'm inside the body of a template. Uh, I can configure sample template arguments. And once I do, I can, uh, I can get IntelliSense based on that particular instantiation of the template inside the template body. Uh, so if I click Edit, um, I can specify here manually uh, the parameters, but um, something new that we added in 2019 is the ability to search inside your code base for all of the instantiations that this template is actually used in. So I don't have to bother typing, and I also get to test my template with the multiple instantiation that it's actually being used. So, so this ran over here. Um, it already popped down. And we got the results, and this is now populated. And we were playing earlier with platform. There's another instantiation with rock, but all I have to do is, uh, is select this uh, sample uh, parameters. And now I should start getting some intelligence. Now begin is actually a constant iterator of a vector platform. And if I go here and type begin arrow, I'm actually going to get members of the platform type. Um, in this case, moving sprite, which is a base class of, of platform type. So that's pretty cool. Now I understand better how this function works, but it goes even beyond that. Uh, because something that IntelliSense does, it actually tells you, um, 
it highlights to you what are the operator's overloads. So something that I couldn't have done with, um, without enabling the template intelligence, I can right click here, do pick the definition on an operator, and I can see that this operator has been overloaded. And if I scroll, um, you can see that um, it actually uses the Y position to, to do the logic here. So that might be relevant information if we actually spend time understanding this code. Um, but this is information that I wouldn't get to unless I'm actually stepping and debugging through all of this code. And I can do all of that now directly in IntelliSense. All right. So this looks all right, right? Um, and hopefully this bookmark needs to go away because I need to set a breakpoint here. Let's see this running. And normally um, I would use uh, the debug target to run uh, my binaries, um, but I can also do that from Test Explorer because this is a test. Uh, so if I just right click here and say debug, that's all I have to do and the, the test will run again. Um, we'll eventually hit the breakpoint. And as soon as I do, I'll have a chance to show you how uh, debugging in this code base looks like. And I don't need the modules for now. Oh, did I click something? Oh, the test passed, look. Um, I really wanted to, uh, to show you the, uh, the just my code debugging. So normally, uh, without just my code debugging, once uh, you hit a breakpoint, Ah, you're right. Thank you, John. Let's try again, and we should see a build now. <laughs> Can you please open a suggestion for that? <laughs> All right, so we hit the breakpoint, and now I can make this go away. Um, so normally, um, without just my code debugging, um, we would be stepping inside the find if function here. So let me just go to definition really quickly uh, to see that this is not something that you normally want to see. Maybe maybe Stefan wants to debug into this code, but um, we, we don't look forward to this. So if I, if I just step into, so I'm going to hit F11 now. Sorry. If I hit F11 now, I'll step directly into the Lambda. All the code that is not my code has been skipped during my stepping into, and uh, I, I can only focus on this code. So let's just hit F5. We already know the test has passed, so it's all goodness. Um, now, we're almost ready to check in, right? What does it matter that this project is cross-platform? It works on Windows, right? Um, so, OK, OK, probably not. Um, so let's figure out if, uh, if this code actually works on other platforms as well. And uh, one thing I could do is just take this source code as it is, move it on the Linux machine, build it there, run all the tests, and make sure that everything works fine. Um, me particularly, I'm not uh, a very advanced Linux user, so I wouldn't feel very comfortable going on that machine and doing that. And also, I would completely forego all of the environment that I have set up here. Uh, luckily, with Visual Studio, you can target uh, Linux remotely very easily. Uh, if you have an SSH connection to uh, um, a Linux device, you can probably configure Visual Studio to connect through that SSH uh, connection, and Visual Studio will do all the heavy lifting for you in trying to make the Linux development experience as close as possible to the Windows experience. So uh, when you build, all of the sources will get moved to the Linux machine transparently. They're going to get built there. When you debug, a uh, GDB session is going to get spun up and it's going to get connected to the Visual Studio debugging session and, and so on. Um, but today I want to do something even better than that. How many of you are familiar with WSL? Okay, wow, that's more than I expected. That's great, almost half of the room. For the rest of you, uh, WSL is uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, this is uh, a subsystem that can run Linux binaries inside Windows 10. Um, it's not a VM. Um, and it can run natively uh, Bash and all the other tools that you may be familiar with Linux. Uh, it, it also serves as a great developer environment for targeting Linux. Um, so you can build ELF binaries, you can debug ELF binaries in it. You can do all of that from the command line when you, do, when you use WSL, but we also build inside Visual Studio integration to connect to WSL automatically, and we are able to discover it, and we're able to configure such an environment. So to do that, what you do is go to Manage Configurations again, 
and you would hit plus here, uh, you get a nice list of different templates that you can use uh, to add different types of configurations to your CMake project. Uh, this is the remote configuration where you would connect through SSH to another Linux machine, but if you scroll down, uh, then you will be able to add WSL debug. Uh, or WSL release. I already have added one here uh, because I wanted to do a full build to save you the agony of watching this for 20 minutes build. Um, but I didn't do any much configuration. Uh, basically, I'd added it here and uh, Visual Studio discovered WSL installation and it just worked. So now if I, uh, if I switch to it, you'll see in the output window CMake being picked up from the WSL installation, um, CMake actually running uh, uh, with a generator of Unix uh, make files, and as soon as the CMake generation finishes, I can do Control Shift B, which will build it, and um, just to show you really quickly, this will generate an ELF binary. If I were to set a breakpoint, um, it will get hit, it will be a GDB symbol, um, I, I will skip that for the purposes of, 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 keep, <laughs> of keeping the pace. Um, so that's, uh, that's WSL consumption. Now the advantage of using WSL is that uh, compared with a remote Linux machine, there's no copying of files involved. Um, and th this can speed up the, the build process uh, very easily. Um, now I showed building on Windows and on Linux this project, but something that I didn't show yet is that this project has a lot of more dependencies that uh, need to be configured as well before this project successfully builds. Um, and to be able to successfully build this project, I use VC package. So let me switch uh, to, uh, to this command prompt. And I have here the full list of, of VC packages, uh, libraries that I had to install to make uh, SuperTux work. Um, to do that, I just had to go do a GitHub clone on, uh, on VC package repo, uh, bootstrap it, and then do VC package install and, and the list of libraries. It took a while because everything is built from source, but now I have them here. And as a, as a second step, I did VC package integrate install, which made sure that Visual Studio knows how to pick up this VC package installation and make it available to all of my MS build projects and make it available to all of my CMake projects that I'm building from Visual Studio. I did something similar with my WSL installation. I went, did git clone, I bootstrapped the VC package, I used the exact same command I used on Windows to install all of the dependencies I have uh, that I need, and then I did VC package integrate install, the same command that I did on Windows, and this enabled Visual Studio when it reaches inside WSL or even in a remote uh, Linux machine to detect that VC package has libraries available and it will make them available to CMake or to MS Build Project. Now, um, I mentioned uh, that there's a lot of goodness um, in Windows for Linux developers as well. Uh, I'll point out that there's a lot of things happening beyond Visual Studio uh, at Microsoft to make, uh, Visual, uh, to make Windows a great developer box for you. And that's whether you're targeting Windows or you're targeting Linux or other platforms. Uh, one example is uh, the Windows terminal here that I have, which is an application in the App Store um, that provides us with, um, with an accelerate, uh, graphically accelerated um, uh, console uh, well, terminal that allows me to configure as many consoles as I want. So I have here a few more configured. Uh, really quickly, I'll uh, do a shameless plug on our new developer PowerShell for Visual Studio 2019. Um, this is uh, accelerated, so lots of uh, nice things here. I can zoom in, I can zoom out. Uh, we can use ligatures if we want to, so I can use nice arrows. Um, whatever. Um, the, the nice thing about this is that you can add as many consoles as you want. You can configure them um, in the settings. I can pick my own themes. Uh, I can pick my own fonts. Uh, it's very easy to, to configure and very easy to, to deal with. All right, so um, I showed you VC package, but um, it's, it's kind of hard to tell how easy it is to really use VC package. So something that I'll do now is directly add a new VC package dependency to our project and hopefully everything works out well on stage. So let's go back to, to Visual Studio. I'll switch to our Windows configuration. And let's, uh, let's make sure that I only add it to the test so that the build will be faster. So I'll double click on this executable and um, as we're here um, at the top of the file, I'll just write find package. 
As you can see, Visual Studio offers nice IntelliSense, autocomplete, and suggestions of how to use Find Package. Um, if I hit Tab, um, actually, uh, it will go one step further and offer autocomplete suggestions for the packages that are available in this package. And not only is it going to offer a description of the package, but also a way of how can I consume this package directly in CMake. Um, I'll just use SQLite because it's probably going a bit faster. Um, and let's say that it's required. Now, the moment I do this, uh, CMake will configure and it will error out because I did not have uh, SQLite installed on my VC package installation. But in addition to that, you can see this light bulb appearing um, that tells me that I have a few options. I can learn more about VC package. I can copy the VC package command to run it myself. Uh, but new in the release, uh, we also allow you to directly install the package using uh, VC package. So I just click this, and in the output window, um, VC package will run, it will install, and you can see the suggestion that I was seeing earlier. So find package and target libraries are the things that I need to put in my CMake project to consume this library. Oh, and it's test. Don't yell at me. All right. Generate. Okay, looks like I got an error. Oh, you know what? I think it's yelling at me. Thanks, Robert, but it's probably because I have two target link libraries, isn't it? Me, an expert in CMake. Not gonna happen. Okay, so, so this worked, and now we successfully configured um, uh, SQLite. So to see this in action, um, let's go back to this target over here. Where is my test target? And at the top of this test, um, we'll just see if SQLite is available. Yeah, it's, it's already here. And I can type SQLite 3, I don't know, lib version. It's probably something very easy to configure. And just to prove that everything works well, I'll build it right now. And VC package will take care of the binary. CMake will take care of linking the binary inside my, uh, inside my test and eventually run with it. I know you noticed the squiggles, and I'll come back to them. But you can see that for this configuration, the build successfully completed. I'm already using uh, libsql in my project. Now, what is the squiggles are telling me is that, hey, you have another configuration that you just configured called WSL release, for which this header is not available. So how about fixing it for uh, there as well? To do that, we'll just switch to the WSL release configuration. And of course, now we get the, the CMake error that the package is missing. It is the same familiar light bulb and the same familiar command. But let me explain what's going to happen when I click this button. Visual Studio will be going inside the WSL environment, calling VC package to install a library that will make my CMake project that is building for WSL work correctly. And if that's not cool, I, I only have a sticker left for you. I <laughs> should be running right now. Uh, it's going to take a bit longer, so, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll come back to it. So we built on Windows using MSVC, and we built on Linux using GCC. Is it something missing from this list? Any other compiler that we could maybe try it on? Clang, OK, OK. So, so let, let, let's give it a try. Uh, the nice thing about Visual Studio 2019 is that it ships with built-in integration with Clang. Um, whether you're targeting Linux, <laughs> whether you're targeting Linux or Windows, um, Visual Studio knows how to build with Clang. For Windows, it's even simpler because Visual Studio Installer ships with, uh, with, uh, with a Clang distribution, and all you need is, is click the checkbox uh, to get these bits on our machine. So um, to do that, uh, I'll, I'll pick a Windows configuration, but just to show to you really quickly that you can use Linux as well. There is the two configurations here for Clang, and you'll have to go do app get install Clang. Much harder to do than on Windows. For Windows, um, we have the 
x86 or x64 client configurations, and I'll just add this one here. I'll save it, and as soon as uh, the saving completes, I'll be able to see it here in the drop down as well. Just give it a second. Okay, there it is. So I switched to Clang Debug. Um, and you can see that CMake is already uh, running a configuration and it's already found Clang 8.01 to be used for this configuration. Um, and as soon as uh, the CMake uh, step finishes, I will have an environment that can build with Clang. I have IntelliSense, I have building, I have debugging. Everything should work just fine. So coming back to one of the files that um, we were using earlier, as soon as this finishes, um, I will get IntelliSense. But one thing you note here at the top is that uh, the selected configuration does not apply to this file. IntelliSense may not be accurate. Um, so this particular file is only available in x86 configuration. And um, this means that this file is not part of any of the CMake targets in this configuration. Um, if I look really quick here, I can see that the test targets are missing. Um, and the reason for that is be because um, this project actually has an option in CMake uh, to configure that, which I didn't do for this uh, version. But similar to CMake GUI, uh, Visual Studio provides a way to configure this. And all I have to, to do is just save this. And as, um, as CMake will rerun again, the, the test target should appear. There it is and an IntelliSense should be available here. Now something that um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but the squiggles just shifted. Did anybody notice that? Something happened with the squiggles and something that we're announcing today is that um, in addition to our static analysis, we're integrating also Clang Tidy as part of the design time experience. So if you're using Clang, by default, we're gonna switch to Clang Tidy and you're gonna get squiggles directly in the editor um, based on that. It's very simple to configure it. Um, if I were to switch to disk view, um, a very simple way to configure Clang Tidy is just by creating a, a Clang Tidy file at the root. Uh, but there's a UI facilities to configure this, this as well. All right, so we did a lot of good in this project. Um, we fixed a test, we added WSL support, uh, we added Clang support. Now I think we're ready to check in. So. So let's, uh, let's go really quick here. Um, we, actually I wanna go to changes and I have, I have made a few changes um, that I'm gonna stage really quickly. And we did good. All right, um, so what I'll do, I'll commit changes and push. Um, this will go in the, in the public repo I have on GitHub. And as soon as this happens, um, We'll also do a PR pull request. Um, so something I'll show you here, all the work we did is in the, in the dev branch, but I wanna take all this code and push it to, uh, to master. So successfully push to origin. Now if I can go here, I can also create a new pull request and I can do all of that. I know you can do all of this from the command line, by the way, but it's also nice that you don't have to switch. All of this is available inside Visual Studio as well. Um, so obviously master sounds like the right branch and this is the branch I used, and I'm ready to create a pull request, and this is gonna take a while. But the reason why I wanna show you this um, is because in addition to just the pull request, this uh, repo has been configured uh, to use uh, Azure DevOps as a CI system. So as soon as this goes through, and I'll open this pull request that I just created, You can see that a bunch of checks are starting to run automatically. Um, they've been triggered by my pull request. And if I click here, I can see more details. Now I'm in the browser and uh, these are builds. And it's pretty nice that I can actually build for Linux, Windows, and Mac at the same time. Um, I don't usually carry my Mac around anymore since they don't let me put it in planes. So um, I... Uh, <laughs> I, I basically use CI system to, uh, to help me validate Mac builds. Um, and this is ongoing right now. You can see that a lot of other builds uh, were successful. Uh, this is gonna take a while, but if I can drill deeper into this one, hopefully we'll see something um, that is going on. This, this build 
um, will, uh, will run, and I want you to stay minimized so that we can see the full outline. Um, we're gonna run VC package and build all the libraries from source. Uh, we're gonna run CMake, and we're not gonna do any guesswork on figuring out the command line for CMake. We're actually gonna use the CMake settings.json that we used inside the IDE to run this build. Thank you. Um, and then we're gonna run all the tests, and if everything goes well, we're gonna get a nice green check mark that, that this works. Um, and all of this is gonna happen in parallel for, for all, of the, all of the three um, targets that I'm, I'm running. Now let's switch to an existing build uh, to show you something else that it's interesting here. You notice the cache VC package step. Um, if you look at the time the run VC package took, uh, that is suspiciously short. And uh, the, when you combine, and that, that, that is basically one of the superpowers that uh, come together when you bring in VC package and Azure DevOps. Um, what we do here is cache VC package across calls. So you get two goods from both words. You build all of your dependencies from source uh, uh, to be consistent with the configurations that you need for your own projects, but you also save time at, build, at, at CI time when you build your projects um, because of this caching. So if, if it's a cache hit, uh, VC package will run really fast. And if I scroll way down, way, way, way down, what you're gonna see is that this is the, the first build that succeeded here um, was the build that took longer. And this is the actual build that um, was the first one to cache the output of VC package. So you can see VC package should actually take 17 minutes. So every time you do a CI run, just think that you're saving at least 17 minutes for this particular project. Who knows how much time you could save for your own project, uh, depending on how many dependencies you have. Um, this, is, uh, this is not very hard to set up. And uh, this is uh, like on, on, the, on the GitHub repo here, this is a good example. You can go and check it out. It's publicly available. Um, but this is just a YAML file with, with three jobs. And you've seen the three jobs uh, lined up there. Um, and you can build one yourself as well. Um, it runs a few tasks. And if I just type VC package here, um, you'll see these tasks over here. Um, if I select run CMake, um, I have also a way to configure this task before I add them to the YAML file. So um, I can use CMake setting JSON or I can do direct invocation. Uh, really quickly, uh, to learn more about the stacks, they're available here. We're gonna productize those. Um, but uh, this, is, this is very simple to, to get started. All right. So that's all I wanted to show today. And now I'm gonna switch to slides and do a quick summary of the different things I showed. And I'll start with the last thing I showed you, Azure DevOps. It's a great way of, of uh, helping your team as the, as the team grows uh, to get better at, at managing tasks and more importantly, using a CI system that scales. Um, specifically for GitHub, if you are an open source contributor, um, you can use Azure Pipelines for free for public and private GitHub repos. Um, and you've seen as I started the job, uh, all three runs started in parallel. Uh, that's because you get up to 10 parallel jobs to run in parallel for public repositories. To learn more, you can go to this uh, ak.ms link. Sorry, let me keep it for one more second. Um, it's cpp slash devops. Um, and you've seen uh, VC package work great inside the uh, CI system, but we also build integration for VC package um, inside Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Um, it's hard to do library dependency management if you don't have the right tools. Um, we hope VC package is, is a great choice. Uh, we believe that with the 1,000 and more libraries that it has in it, uh, you should give it a try. Um, it's as simple as doing VC package install library name across all of the three operating systems that it supports, whether it's Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Um, if you want to learn more about the troubles we went into building this and uh, the amazing contributions we got from the community, uh, please go uh, see the two talks that Robert is going to do later in the week. Um, and if you want to learn more specifically about VC package, we have an aka.ms for that as well, slash VC package. Coming back to Visual Studio, I showed you the CMake experience. Um, that does not require you to generate solutions and projects to take advantage of it. Um, it can target Linux, Windows, and other operating systems, uh, other platforms as well. Um, and we constantly innovate. You've seen the new CMake settings UI that we have created, um, as well as the VC package integration. And there's a lot more uh, to discover if you check out our blog or follow the, the CMake uh, aka.ms. New in 2019 is the Clang LLVM integration. 
Uh, again, as I mentioned, it, it works both for Linux and for Windows. And today we're announcing Clang Tidy integration coming uh, in 16.4, which uh, conveniently is going to drop next week as you come back to your offices, if you decide to go back to your offices. Um, um, and I hope that you'll upgrade and give it a try and give us your feedback. Um, you see us talk a lot about uh, the features that we announce working both for Windows and Linux, and that's because we care a lot about Linux being a target. We want to make Linux targeting as seamless as targeting Windows uh, with the work we're doing with integrating with WSL. Um, but it can go other way as well. We're bringing features that are only available on Linux into the Visual Studio environment. And one example is ASAN, which I haven't shown today. Um, uh, basically, the ability of running ASAN and the debugging integration to make that happen when you're targeting Linux. Um, really quickly, I'm going to cover the IDE performance improvements, but really this is kind of the, the biggest highlight. If I were to pick one thing, um, you probably, I was moving too fast in the IDE. You haven't noticed how much snappier the IDE is. Uh -huh. Either way, it's fast, right? Um, but um, I'll, the, the important improvements that we have is in the CMake scenario, for example, we have a 2x improvement. A lot of things happen when you open a CMake project. Uh, first of all, there's the scanning of the, of the whole folder. Then there's the CMake configure step running. Then there is uh, uh, the IntelliSense engine re reaching into the CMake cache and creating a full database of symbols. All of those pieces have been improved in 2019 to get a 2x improvement in the time it takes to, to load a solution and to the point where you have IntelliSense ready. For Linux, uh, there's an additional step because Visual Studio needs to take all of the sources and move them on a remote machine. Uh, so uh, that, that's a 3x improvement. Um, notably, the debugger was a problem in previous releases with the memory consumption that it had for large, large projects. Uh, we heard that loud and clear. So now in 2019, this is an out of proc process that loads all of the symbols. And um, if you're not using any uh, uh, VS extensions that are memory hungry, now DevEnv in 2019 will not go higher than 60, 600 megabytes or 800 megabytes. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, last but not least, uh, the IntelliSense ready here, I'll explain. Uh, this is an improvement that um, you're going to get to experience every day as you type code. So the only 30%, it's actually quite significant improvement uh, because this is the work IntelliSense does as you type in the code to recompile the full translation unit and refresh all of the symbols that are visible based on your changes. Um, I've been told that uh, it can be when you hit dot and you don't see the member that you just added, it can be frustrating and at times uh, I heard that uh, rage uh, comes up uh, as, a, as an epithet about describing the experience. Um, really hope that you're going to notice all these this improvements and you're going to have a greater experience with upgrading 2019. Um, there's a lot more productivity features to, to know about and I only showed a few but if you want to see even more uh, please go check out uh, Nick's session tomorrow. I'm going to get a, a lot more for you to, uh, to show but uh, from this list there's one other feature that I want to talk about that I haven't demoed, um, but we did demo it last year when it was uh, in the forward-looking section of this talk. Um, it was still experimental. It hasn't shipped yet. Uh, now it's part of the product. Uh, it's available in Visual Studio and it's available in Visual Studio Code. This is LiveShare. So what is LiveShare? Uh, you should think of it a way, um, a feature to enhance the collaboration you have with your whole team. Um, you can invite someone to your own environment and they don't need to set up any of the files, any of the environment that you have on your local machine to join in. Uh, they're able to follow you with the problems that you want to show them, um, help you take control, make changes to the code as you make changes to the code, uh, debug together, step over code. Um, really a, a real collaboration whether the person is next to you or is somewhere remote on the other part of the world. And uh, not only that, but this is... Uh, this is targeting, uh, this is not limited to two people. You can, as many can connect. So you can do code reviews, you can do hackathons, you can, you can even teach a class using LiveShare. It's good for all of those scenarios. Really quickly, in summary, uh, I showed you the improvements we made in the inner loop and how Visual Studio can serve as an on-ramp uh, as your team grows uh, to set up a CI system. Um, we're, we're making great improvements in the way we enable targeting platforms. Um, 
we adding more and more tools such that you don't have to make the choice between Visual Studio and the, the C++ tools of choice that you use by adding Clang LLV and Clang Tidy today to an already long list of, of tools that we have integrated like uh, Google Test, Boost Test, and others. And with that, we're going to switch to talk about MSVC compiler. Yep. So very quickly, we're going to talk about all of these four aspects of the compiler tool set, what we've been working on. So last year, we announced that our, um, the Visual Studio 2017 was um, a complete C++ 17 compiler. We did a lot of work on conformance and improving our tools. Now, our standard library is also C++ 17 complete. If you'd like to hear about the work we did on, the work Stefan did on CarCon, go to his talk on Thursday. C++ 20 progress. So we now support um, partial support for coroutines, modules, and the spaceship operator, or through a comparison. We've also added feature test macros, removed CBREF, and um, those fixes to aggregate initialization, which were kind of weird. Uh, the thing which is not on here is modules, because you can go and see uh, Gabby's talk. And we're announcing that we are feature complete for C++ 20 modules. So if you go and get um, latest compiler, you pass to C++ latest, you can try out modules. Please do. Please send us concepts. any issues. Concepts. concepts. It's a long day. It's a long day. OK. The next thing is also conformance related. But it's not something that we're adding to our tool set. It's something which we hope will help anyone. I mean, I said at the start of the talk that we don't want to make like, just our tool users' lives better. We want to make the whole C++ community um, better through what we're doing. So this next announcement, no matter whether you're just following along or you want to help out or you just want to benefit passively, hopefully we will help you out. So the announcement is, as of today, our SDL is now open source. So this is our, again, C++17 complete standard library. You can go check it out on GitHub at this uh, link. We have a blog post, which is hopefully live now-ish. Yes, thank you. Uh, please check it out. We're, um, it's still an ongoing process of getting our testing set up so that we can do uh, pull requests and things like that. But you can go check out the code, and you can consider how you can help us out. Um, we want everything to be out in the open. So it's all on GitHub, and you can kind of track our changes, uh, help us out. It's also under the Apache 2 license with LLVM extensions, which is the same license which uh, libc++ uses. So our idea is hopefully in the future, we can all come together to contribute and share things between these projects. Because like developing a standard library, it doesn't have to be a competition. We're all trying to make people's lives better and to improve our ecosystem. So if we can all work together, then we can all benefit. So please do check that out and uh, let us know your thoughts. Uh, some linker improvements. We did a lot of work on build throughput. Um, you know, link times are a real pain point in C++. So we've made improvements which you'll see no matter if you're using fast link or if you're using full debugging um, for the linking. You will see like two times, three times, up to six times performance. So please try that out and let us know if it's helping out your applications. If you'd like to accelerate your build more, we also have Incredibuild, which you can install through the Visual Studio installer. So please try that out as well. You can get up to 16 cores for free on both builds. Uh, runtime performance. These are numbers from the Unreal Engine Infiltrator demo. And this is coming from a bunch of different changes we've been making for um, vectorization, for um, compiler intrinsics, for things like memset, uh, and other just general compiler optimizations we've been working on. We also have a new exception handler, which you can use, which uh, reduces the size of your binaries by a lot if you have a lot of heavy exception usage. And we also have a new inliner flag, which will do more aggressive inlining. Uh, on code analysis, we're doing a lot of work on making things safer. So you saw the green squiggles in your editor, which is running in the background and giving you feedback on what's going on. 
So we have new concurrency and coroutines checks, um, checks for use after move, and the one which I'm really excited about is lifetime profile, which you maybe heard about, about last year. There is also a talk on lifetime analysis, which you can go to on Wednesday if you'd like to hear more about that. Um, also, address sanitizer is coming to MSBC. So static analysis, thank you. <laughs> static analysis is just part of the puzzle. Dynamic analysis is also super helpful, and this is something which should really help out in making sure that your programs are safe. So this is library compiler support. You will get integration into the debugger and MS Build CMake. So hopefully this will make people's lives a lot better. If you want to hear more about this, there's an entire talk on Wednesday. Please go. That is us for compilers. We have four minutes, so we'll not do this demo. I'll do one demo, though. <laughs> do one demo. <laughs> I'll challenge you to okay. do a demo. Um, I, I want to ask you a quick question. You got to go back to the time where you were part of a team. You just joined this team. Uh, ignore all the signing of documents you did and uh, uh, all of the, the um, legal training or anything else. Think of the time you sit down at your desk and you start configuring the environment to get it working to a place where uh, you can build the project you're going to be working for the next who knows how many months, running all the tests and, uh, and, and successfully uh, building it. Was it more than a week? Anyone? Hopefully not. But if anyone, uh, that I, I got a quick demo for you. Uh, less than a week? OK, that's good. Less than a day to set up such an environment? Less than an hour? One. Less than five minutes? OK. All right. So let's do a five-minute demo. And uh, this, is not a, three. this is not a real demo. This is a, a video. That's why it's going to go faster. Sorry. <laughs> um, so what we're working on, and this is a work in progress, this is a prototype, um, is the idea of cloud environments, a way for you to speed up this creation of environment. Because as you've seen, all of us have this problem of setting up these environments. Um, and one thing that we're going to be doing is making it very easy to do this type of, uh, of creation. Um, you see here, um, what happened is uh, basically we, we paste in the URL of the GitHub uh, repo that we want to we wanna, uh, develop on. Um, and this tool started creating an environment by looking at the GitHub repo and understand what's in it. So it got C++, it's got CMake. It already started behind the scenes to install in the cloud environment, Visual Studio with the, C, with the C++ component checked, with the CMake component checked if there's some Python files in there. Python will be there available as well. And all you need to do is now connect from there. And what happens now in this video is my local Visual Studio running here connects to a remote instance running in the cloud. I don't have any of these files physically here on disk. But all of this work is done remotely to bring in this information locally and only the information that I need. Um, you'll see IntelliSense running here. And again, IntelliSense is running in the cloud. It's, it, that's where all of the processing is happening. You can see the CPU and memory and disk barely getting any usage. Uh, but IntelliSense works seamless, and it works as easy as if you were locally on, on the box. I'll go faster for the purposes of time. This is not specific only to IntelliSense. You can do testing, you can do building, and again, the value of having a remote machine. Now you can, uh, you can do email, you can play games, or whatever you do when you run the test. Now they're actually going to work uh, because you're going to have enough CPU for them uh, to, to go through. Um, and this is not limited to one cloud environment. And usually we're, we're tied to the physical machines that we have to create this environment. You can create as many as you want. If you need a long-term services branch that from a product that you maintain only maybe once every six months, you can still have that cloud environment set up. If you want a branch that has all the features from your team, you can have a cloud environment for that. If you have one for the branch that uh, you're actively developing a feature, you can have a cloud environment for that. And when you go home, Hopefully, you don't need to connect to it, but you have to. Then those cloud environments are available as well. When you're traveling to CPPCon, you can do a lot of work on your, on your machine without carrying all the, all the hard uh, desktop boxes you have uh, at, under your desk. So that's something that we're working on. We are in a private preview right now. So if this sounds 
appealing to you, please come at our booth and, and sign up for this program. Uh, later in the year, uh, there is Ignite, uh, which is a Microsoft conference where we're gonna have more to share about this scenario. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to the slides. Cool, I'll try to keep you no longer, but um, just got a little bit more to work through. If my clicker decides to work, it does not. Okay, I'm coming over here. Right, so um, developer community is how we get suggestions from all of you folks. So if you uh, send us suggestions, if you upvote issues, we see them and we act on them. So one of the most um, upvoted suggestions was you want to use libraries in Compiler Explorer with MSVC, and today you can do that. So if you go to godbolt.org, uh, switch to an MSVC compiler, you can use um, various libraries which are installed there. So please try that out. Another is um, a lot of you are really interested in more OpenMP features. So we do have support for OpenMP4 SIMD um, pragmas on loops. So if you add this pragma to your loop, you can make use of those vectorization capabilities if you use the right flag. The C++ community, this is some research we did based on Stack Overflow and some other sources. We think there are about 5.8 million C and C++ developers in the world right now. And uh, these operating systems are the primary development environment they're using. So 50% of people are doing most of their development on Windows. They might be targeting other platforms, but most of the development's there. Similarly, Linux 31, Mac 19. Uh, some other information from Stack Overflow surveys as um, this is data not just related to C++, but across the ecosystem. Uh, Visual Studio Code was the highest, the, the most used development environment for all developers, followed by Visual Studio. So a lot of people are using our tools and helping to improve them through suggestions and feedback. Um, for interest, for platforms, there's a lot of cross-platform development going on, reading between the lines just how the percentages uh, line up. But 50% you know, people targeting Linux and Windows, lots of people using Docker and Android. Again, this is not just C++, but you get a picture of the wealth of platforms which are being targeted. Um, from GitHub, they had a state of the Octoverse survey, and uh, well, based on you know, all of the repos which are in GitHub, so we're seeing that C++ is, it's not going anywhere. It's been sticking there, it's been going up in uh, 2017, and it's not going anywhere. So if you're using C++, keep going. There's nothing to stop you. Uh, the fastest growing language is CMake is up there, which I have mixed feelings about. <laughs> but more people are doing CMake development, so you know that says something. Um, this is data gathered from the um, ISO CPP survey which went out. Um, so the question here was, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about C++, what would you change? And you can see we've got package management, compile times, modules, reflection. Uh, a lot of these are things which we're really investing in. Package manager for VC package. Uh, you saw that we've been doing lots of work on build throughput, linkers. Um, and we've been doing work in the standards for reflection and exceptions and things like that. So to briefly recap, the mission of our C++ team is to improve the lives of every C++ developer, no matter if you're using our tools or not, through all of these means. And hopefully you've seen a lot of these in this talk, and you can see more of them in other talks later on. Thank you. <laughs>